right, good morning, welcome, and uh, welcome to you online who are watching with us. Uh, it's a bit of a chilly morning that we did not expect, and so uh, you get the warmer service of the two this morning. But uh, as you get settled, I want to read just a section from Jeremiah chapter 10 uh, as our call to worship. Jeremiah is writing on behalf of the Lord to the nation of Israel regarding uh, warning them against trying to be like the other nations, to go after the gods of the other nations. And so he is warning them of idolatry. And in the middle of this, he says about the Lord, No one is like you, Lord, Yahweh. You are great, and your name is mighty in power. Who should not fear you, king of the nations? This is your due. Among all the wise leaders of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. And uh, as we worship in our setting, in our day and age, um, I think it's a good word for us. There, there is none like the Lord, our God. There is none wise like Him. There is none kind and good like Him. There, there is simply none who compare. And so uh, we fix our eyes on Him this morning, and we set our hearts on His goodness and His glory. And so uh, I want to give you just a second just to kind of lay your heart before the Lord. And, and again, just to ask Him, would you, by your Holy Spirit, lead me in to behold Christ, to worship you this morning? And uh, take, I don't know, 30 seconds, and then we're going to pray. Uh, I'm sorry, then we're going to uh, sing together. Uh, just songs of prayers and adoration uh, unto the Lord. So ask him to do that, and then I'll uh, sing. Uh, we come after another week uh, needing you to lead us, needing you to minister grace and mercy to us, needing you to uh, care for our hearts and our souls and to lift our eyes heavenward that we would not grow weary seeking after the things of God. We need reminded uh, that you are the great one, that there is none who compare to you, that our God is unlike any other, and so may we be the joyful ones. May we be the hope-filled ones and the secure ones because of who you are. And as we sing, as we hear your word, may we do so with joy, with gratitude, because we have been born into your kingdom, into your family, because of the grace that you have shown us in Jesus Christ. And so we come and exalt you this morning. And uh, we lift you high as we sing together. And we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. God is a life giver. He's a source of everything that is love.
thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Yeah, amen. Let me just uh, pray for us one more time as Phil uh, comes up. Father, thank you for the, the privilege of being your church. Thank you for a context to come and gather and see one another and hear one another and sing uh, praises that are rooted in, in eternal truths in the gospel. Thank you that we have a substance for our hope, that we have a strong anchor, and it is you and your character and your promises all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so we sing with the angels uh, the praises of your name. And we sing with the saints, and we, we pray also, even in light of this morning's sermon, that, that many more would come to put their faith in Christ and join in a worshiping body that ascribes glory to King Jesus. And so, uh, as Phil preaches your word, would you be with him, and would you uh, prepare our hearts to hear and receive your word, and would you shape us after the likeness of Christ by it, and we pray Jesus in your name, amen. Maybe we can sing. Welcome to the Church this morning. We're glad that you're with us. A couple of announcements as you take your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 4 this morning. Uh, one of the announcements concerns Easter. Easter is coming up two weeks away. It's hard to believe it's that close, but in two weeks we'll be doing Easter. Uh, we normally have a sunrise service on Easter out at the causeway very early in the morning. We are not doing that this year. Uh, we will be providing more of a personal guide. So if there is a We'll be talking about that more next week, so if there's, uh, if you want to participate in that and be a part of that, we'll have some information for you about how you can lead maybe your own family in, in a, in a uh, Resurrection Sunday morning service, but that'll be going on uh, on Easter Sunday. Our regular services will be taking place right here, 8 a.m., 10 a.m. on Easter Sunday, so we're looking forward to celebrating the Resurrection of our Lord on that particular Sunday. The other announcement concerns Harriet's and uh, the... the Harriet's is putting together sort of what we're calling a procurement team. They are um, needing some people to get involved in purchasing. And so it's, it's, don't worry, you don't have to buy things. We have the funds for that. We supply that. But uh, to oversee that process. And so uh, as they uh, kind of transition toward that, uh, they're looking for anybody else that would be interested in helping in that or if you have a background in that, either with purchasing or you're decent with numbers, those sorts of things, and have the time available, we, we would love for you to get in contact with Harriet's and, and uh, be able to serve in that capacity with them. Uh, but you can get in contact with me uh, or Sharon Wilson or Josh and, or uh, Eva in the office, and we will definitely point you in the right direction. So we wanted to make that announcement this morning as well. Colossians chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 2 to 6 in a sermon that we are entitling Gospel Proclamation. Let's read our passage together here. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer gospel proclamation. This passage is about evangelism. 
and our need to be spreading the gospel. But at any time a message on evangelism or a passage on evangelism comes up, I don't know about you, but there's always somewhat of this uneasiness with me. And it, it mainly revolves around the notion that I, I feel guilty that I don't do it enough. And there's this, I don't know why, but there's this tendency, I think, for many of us evangelism or avoid thinking about evangelism or feeling guilty around the fact that we don't evangelize enough. And I know it's not just me that struggles with that. I know that many of you struggle with that. Years ago, we used to have what we called beach evangelism here at Clearwater Community Church. And on Saturdays, I think it was every other Saturday, we would, a group of us would go out to Clearwater Beach and we would, you know, canvas Clearwater Beach and we'd hand out tracts and we'd engage people in conversations about the gospel. Uh, and uh, I would participate in a number of those. I wasn't the person heading that particular effort up. But by the amount of people that showed up to do it, I know that many of you aren't gravitating toward in-your-face confrontational evangelism. All right, We would have just a handful of people that would typically participate in that. Why? Most of us are uncomfortable. Just cold turkey going up to somebody and you know, asking them, if you were to die today, do you know where you would spend eternity? I mean, most of us, that's just not a conversation we want to engage in. We don't we have, we have a fear of people, a fear of rejection, a fear of, I don't want to do that. We have uh, maybe even a, a, uh, a negative attitude or thought toward the idea of that sort of sales-pitched approach to evangelism. We have a desire to be liked and not thought of as odd or out of touch. And so many of us avoid evangelism or the talk of evangelism altogether. I think there's a few reasons why this is this way today as opposed to even a generation or two ago. Because I can remember growing up and uh, growing up in a, a pastor's home where door-to-door -door calling was a, a regular part of, you know, Thursday evenings where my dad would do that. Um, and I know that was a, a church activity that many people were involved in. And, and why has that seemed to wane in more recent years? And I, I think part of it is uh, we, we used to have an audience in America that as we would engage them, were, were familiar with the gospel or grew up in a Christian home or had that church tradition in their background. And so conversations in and around the gospel weren't that difficult to have with people. And today, more and more, we're finding a culture that is out of step, out of touch with, and, and, and ignorant of the Bible altogether or grew up in a context where they didn't go to church and had nothing like that. And so how do we engage the culture in which we live with the gospel? Because the reality is, Jesus' great commission hasn't gone away. It's still there for us. We still have that go and make disciples, that all power is given unto you and go to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like We have that commission still before us today. And that's not an optional thing. It's a necessary component of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. This is something we are to be. So let's look at this passage today and see how it challenges us on this gospel proclamation. I'm going to state the main idea of the sermon right up front. It's this. We must see ourselves as God's instrument to reveal the gospel to the world around us. We must see ourselves as that instrument. God's instrument to reveal the gospel to the world around us. This passage gives us two actions that we can be involved in so that we are doing this. The first is to pray. In verses 2 to 4, the theme of prayer dominates this stretch of text as Paul asks us to enter into prayer. He asked his original audience to enter into prayer. In light of the days in which they were living, these last days, we must devote ourselves to prayer. Over and over throughout this letter, Paul has been focused on the, the actions of believers toward one another, actions of believers in their own disciplines and their own attitudes. Chapter 3 was full of this, right? That we are to, as the, the banner set says here, that we are to set our hearts on minds on the things above where Christ is seated and how that works itself out in, then in our relationships with one another. We're to love one another. We're to be patient, humble, submit ourselves, thankful to Christ. We're to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Everything that we are to do, whether it's in word or deed, is to be done in the name of Jesus our Lord. 
And at the end of chapter 3, we saw how this works itself out in the relationships within the home and in our workplaces. But in these last verses, 2 through 6, before the, the kind of the closing of the letter here, Paul moves the attention of his first readers and moves our attention off of those relationships within the body of Christ to relationships outside the body of Christ, outside of the church, outside of the faith community. He turns our attention to those who aren't followers of Jesus Christ and what our attitude needs to be towards them. And it begins with prayer. We are to be in prayer for one another for the opportunities to share the gospel. How are we supposed to pray? He, in verse 2, he gives us three ways that we are to enter into prayer. We're to enter into prayer devotedly. Devote yourselves to prayer. Devotedly. It, it, it implies a perseverance, a faithfulness, a consistency. And in my conversations with you, not only do I know that you probably don't love that confrontational style of evangelism, but I know that many of you, as I've talked to you, uh, if you would look at a discipline, a Christian discipline, a discipleship discipline that should be a part of your life, one that seems to be lacking in a lot of our lives is that consistency in prayer. That regular, daily entering into and coming before God in prayer. It's easier for us to do something. Give us the Word of God, that devotional plan where I can have this Bible reading and I can read through Scripture. Many of us can do that. We can discipline ourselves to read God's Word. Or service, to enter into service where give me an activity that I can do within the body of Christ and I will gladly serve in that capacity, especially if it's something that matches up with my gifting. Or, or fellowship, we like to be around other believers and so we'll enter into fellowship with one another. Even giving, it's easy to just, you know, take that, that uh, checkbook out or whatever and give to the church. That's a, an easy discipline that many of us have made a part of our life. But for whatever reason, prayer is one that Christians today seem to struggle with. That consistency of coming before God in prayer, spending time alone with Him, talking to Him. And yet we know at the same time that when we enter into prayer, we are talking to whom? The most powerful and important being in the entire universe. That wants us to communicate with Him. And He wants to enter into communication with us. Paul prayed at the beginning of this that they would have this knowledge of God. And Paul prayed for them, as he speaks about, daily. These were believers that he had never even met, and yet he prayed for them daily. There was a consistency there. So when Paul gives us this command at the end of the letter, devote yourselves to prayer, there must be a devotedness, a discipline, a consistency. And maybe you're sitting here and hearing this and thinking, man, Phil, I, I, I want that. But I've started and stopped and started and stopped and started and stopped so many times. I really do think it requires a disciplined approach at first. We, we don't like to make these Christian disciplines, these duties, these things that we have to ingrain into ourselves, but there is some of that that's part of the Christian life. And I think prayer is one of those that has to, we have to make room for it and then enter into it with a disciplined approach. That time that you set aside to read God's Word on a daily basis, build out another 10 minutes in there to approach Him in prayer. Maybe get up a little bit earlier. But that time needed in prayer is essential for us. And there are some plans out there. Just like there are reading plans, there are prayer plans. If you go online and look up Matthew Henry, the guy wrote, I can't even remember when Matthew Henry lived. I think it's in the 1700s, but it might have even been before that. But Matthew Henry has written a book entitled Method of Prayer. It's a great prayer guide. And it produces, you know, daily, not just prayers that you recite back to God, but it goes through Scripture and just brings up request after request that we can be praying for ourselves, whether it's in the area of adoration toward God or confession or thanksgiving or supplications. And if you go on the website, they actually created a website, Matthew Henry didn't, but somebody's taken his book and created one. 
you sign up for it and it gives you a prayer each day. It'll send it right to your email and say, this is what you can be praying for today. It's a great reminder to enter into prayer. Paul Miller's book, A Praying Life, is a great resource to, to read and just be challenged by. And he gives some great practical application of how to get more consistent in your prayer life. But some of us need that, that a little bit more discipline if we're going to approach this devotedness, to be devoted in our prayer life. Paul says pray devotedly. He says pray urgently. Devote yourselves to prayer being watchful. The verb here appears in other critical situations where prayer is used. Jesus in Mark 14, 38 told his disciples to be alert, be watchful, and pray so that they would not fall into temptation. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, Revelation 3, 3, this word is used of prayer in eschatological contexts. We are to be alert in our prayers because of the times in which we are living. There's an urgency to the times. We are living in a time where we we are anticipating Christ's coming when he will be revealed in his glory. Thus, we need to be watchful, alert, in anticipation of this coming. And one way to do that is through prayer. If we are praying, it gives us this Christ awareness and the urgency of the time in which we are living. Do you live with an urgency that Christ could come at any moment? Your prayer life is a telltale sign of whether or not you do. How are we to pray? Devotedly, urgently, thirdly, thankfully here, he says at the end of verse 2. Being watchful and thankful. Thanksgiving and thankfulness is, as we've mentioned a number of times, is this theme that occurs over and over and over again in Colossians. Paul's urging us to be thankful. And typically when we think of thankfulness, what do we think of? Well, we think of saying thank you to something that somebody's done to us or something that's happened for us in the past. We learn that at a very early age. You know, parents come up to you, go say thank you. They gave you a piece of candy, you know, and so you got to go over there and say thank you. But I've received something. Something's been given to me, and so I'm thankful for an act that's been done to me. And we tend to view thanking God in the same manner that we look back on what God has done for us. And yet many times, Paul asks us, to express thanks, not for what God has done for us in the past, but for what God is doing in us and will do for us in the future. 1 Corinthians 15 is the passage on the resurrection, and we will talk about this probably in two weeks on Easter. But that whole chapter lays out the resurrection of Christ, and then its implications for the life of the believer, that we have been raised with Christ, and then what that means for us. And it looks forward in verses 51 and following to that day when Christ returns and that we are with him, we are raised with him on that ultimate resurrection day. And at the very end of that passage, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, thanks be to God as he looks forward to that day of resurrection. Do we ever thank God, not only for what he's done for us, but the fact that our future is settled in Jesus Christ? That that glory that he has prepared for us, that redemption, that salvation that we await, we don't have to worry about Judgment Day. We don't have to worry about facing the wrath of God because he's saved us from that. And we are already, in a sense, seated with Christ. Raised with him and seated with him. Therefore, we can be thankful now for what will happen to us on that day. Do we consistently and constantly thank God for what he will do for us in revealing Christ's glory? We don't do that very often. Imagine with me for a moment that you have a grandparent, or maybe a parent, depending on stage of life that you're in, that's getting up there in age, but they are a billionaire, and they are going to leave you with every bit of their riches. I don't know about you, but I would be writing them and texting them and sending them and spending time with them and and telling them how thankful I am for, not the day that they're passing, but the fact that I'm going to be inheriting all of that stuff. 
Jesus has all of that in store for us. We're guaranteed that future. That's much greater than the riches of this world. Are we thankful and grateful in our prayers for what we will have in Jesus Christ? When we are and when we focus on that, it's going to affect and start to change the way that we live in the present. That's where Paul goes to next in this prayer. How to pray, verse 2, but now what to pray for in verses 3 and 4. He says, and pray for us that God may give us or may open up for us a door for our message to proclaim the mystery of Christ. What are we to be praying for? Gospel proclamation. That God will give us his followers and give us his church and those that we send out opportunities, and confidence and clarity to speak of Jesus Christ. What are we to pray for? First of all, this opportunity, God, to open up doors to proclaim the gospel. We must pray that God provides us with opportunities to present the gospel. You see, it's through the word that Jesus Christ saves. Through the message, our message, it's this this idea of the word. It's the spoken word revealed here, but then proclaimed by us. And what are we proclaiming? That we, in and of ourselves, are sinners. And that we are separated from God. And there isn't anything that you or I can do to bring ourselves into right relationship with God. Nothing that we can do to earn it. Nothing that we can do to be born into it or be, go through a ritual to attain it. Rather, God looked on our helpless state and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to perfectly fulfill the law, to then lay himself down as that perfect sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sin, the judgment, to take on him the judgment of our sin, and then to defeat sin and death by rising from the dead. And as we place our faith and our trust in what Jesus Christ has done, we come into, again, right relationship with God. That's his grace. That's his salvation bestowed upon us simply by placing our faith in the work that Jesus Christ has done. This is that great mystery. Christ is in us. And we receive the glory of Christ through faith. Paul says, pray that we have opportunities to share that message. Are we praying for opportunities to share that gospel message? Do we pray for the lost that are in our lives, that God would give us open doors for our family members, our workplaces, our neighbors, our community? This this passage was a challenge again to me this last week because it pointed at the fact that I used to pray every day for my lost family members and neighbors or friends. I would just beg God to save them as a teenager. And I don't know when and where that ceased happening on a daily basis in my life, but now I pray for them occasionally. And it was interesting how God would burden me, even when I was praying for them on a repeated basis with Phil, you should write a letter to some of them. You should reach out. You should look for opportunity to share that. There was a much more of an urgency there. There was a much more of a conviction there. There was much more of a, not only sensing the need, but to do something about the need. You see, when we're praying for the lost, Christ reveals to us that, guess what? You're the instrument that I'm preparing to reach that lost person. And we start looking for those opportunities and those open doors. We need to pray that more. We don't, I think, have the urgency of the moment praying for these open doors. And we lose the awareness of the mission that is before us. As we enter into it, God will reveal it and he will open those doors. And sometimes as those doors open, It'll be not only that we can proclaim the mystery of Christ, but as Paul closes out the verse, it's not this easy opportunity typically. He says, for which I am in chains. You see, the gospel and the proclamation of the gospel didn't result in just 
blessing and perfection and ease for Paul, what did it result in? Suffering. Paul's writing this letter from jail, prison. Because his proclamation and his stand for the gospel was rejected. But it was opening other opportunities for him to share the gospel even more, even in, those, even in his imprisonment. It's fascinating. Paul doesn't pray here for deliverance from his imprisonment. He prays for what? Witness in his imprisonment. He wants the believers to pray, not that God gets me out of this, but that God gives me opportunity and open doors, even here, to spread the gospel. You see, even in the midst of suffering and in persecution, the gospel goes forward. We preached this message a number of years ago, not this exact message, but this passage, and I was looking back over those notes, and as I was looking over those notes, I noticed that it was in the context of, I think it was when Kayla Van Voorhees had gone home to be with the Lord, and her testimony was part of this, sharing this, and it was just that, just that reminder of even in the midst of suffering, as a believer goes through suffering, the opportunities that that believer now has to share the hope that they have in Jesus Christ. You see, in the midst of suffering, that doesn't close the doors on the gospel. It very much opens the doors up. I know a number of younger families especially were praying over these last months for this family, the Broom family in our area, because they go to, their children go to school with that family, and uh, they went through a tra- just a tragic situation with their four-year-old son who developed a very rare form of brain cancer and passed away just a few weeks ago. And in the midst of that tragedy, it still was just this amazing flourishing of the gospel, where the gospel became clear through this family that stuck with Jesus Christ in the midst of all of that and weren't afraid to proclaim that, and how the gospel was able to work in and through and shine its light out of tragedy. Suffering doesn't close the doors to the gospel. It opens them up. And we need to see our lives, whatever stage of life we are in, as open opportunities to share the gospel. One other application that I'd like to make off of this is Paul is asking the believers to pray for him. We don't just simply pray for our own opportunities, but are we praying for one another's opportunities? In our church, we we send out a number of missionaries from our church And every single month, a a missionary newsletter update goes out with fresh updates of what's going on in these missionaries' lives and also new prayer requests that we can be praying for them. And and many of them are around the spread of the gospel in those different contexts. And I know a number of us pray for these missionaries, but there's a number of us who aren't regularly receiving that newsletter and update and entering into prayer for our opportunities on the mission field. The part of our great commission is that we go to the uttermost parts of the world, and the way that we primarily do that as a church is through our missionaries. Are we praying for our missionaries on a regular basis, lifting them up, praying for open doors for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the impact that they can have on those mission fields, and lifting them up before God? I know Debbie Lichtenberg sitting back there, and she sends that out. Uh, every every month. So talk to me, talk to her. We'd love to get you on that emailing and so that you can receive that and lift our missionaries up. But we as a church need to regularly lift up our missionaries and the opportunities they have to share the gospel. What are we to pray for? Opportunity and also confidence. And as somebody else pointed out to me between services, clarity is kind of the idea of how the end of verse 3 or 4 ends. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly confidently as I should. What are we to pray for? A boldness, a confidence, and a clarity to enter into these conversations. It's fascinating. Paul even needs this prayer for himself. Pray that I speak it, he says. If anybody should have the boldness and the clarity with which to present the gospel, it would be the Apostle Paul, and yet he asks believers to pray for him along those lines. 
that he might make known and manifest and demonstrate the reality of who Christ in him is and what Christ has done for him. You see, what Paul realized is what we need to realize, and that is that we are simply instruments of the grace of God. We aren't the end. Jesus Christ is the end. We are simply instruments. We are really in and of ourselves nothing but God's instruments. And each and every one of us can be similarly used by God in whatever place he puts us to make known the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul needs prayer for that. You need prayer for that. I need prayer for that. So that we will have the confidence to speak it when the door opens and the clarity with which to present it into those situations so that it's heard and used by the Holy Spirit to draw people to himself. Are we praying as the first step, first action in our proclamation of the gospel for those opportunities, that confidence? Are we praying with an urgency that the gospel might go forward from Clearwater Community Church? The second action that Paul calls us to here is then in verses 5 and 6, not only to pray, but to walk wisely before the world. It says at the very beginning of verse 5 there, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. We've, ex- we've seen this expression already in Colossians. Colossians 1.10 says it this way, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way. That phrase, live a life worthy, is the same Greek verb here, to walk He used it again in uh, not only in 1.10, but 2.6, where he says, So then, just as you received Christ as Lord, continue to walk in him, live your lives in him. And then 3.7, you used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. He's talking about what they came out of. All of those other translations of this in these other verses hit on the idea of what this phrase means means to walk wisely is to live a life according to wisdom it pops up in all of the major sections of this particular letter that we are to live our lives in a certain way and the way here is wisely and when we hear wisely this doesn't simply mean to make smart decisions it's more than that it means to live a life that reveals Christ is in you wisdom ultimately culminates in Jesus Christ in Scripture. Therefore, if we are to live our lives according to wisdom, to live wisely, we are to live our lives centered and finalizing itself in Jesus Christ. Our life is all about Jesus Christ. Do your life reveal Him? Last night we were watching, this last weekend I've been watching a lot of basketball, right, because it's March Madness going on right now. And uh, we were the girls, Tia and Emily, were, we, uh, I have a college, um, uh, one of the men I graduated with in college, and it was a small Christian college, so was, I knew him not well, but I knew him fairly well. Uh, he's now the head basketball coach for uh, the University of Alabama, so we're rooting for Alabama in this tournament. I would never say roll tide, but no, I'm going to do that for basketball for this season as long as, as Nate is coaching them. But um, so we're watching them, we're watching basketball, and I was watching some games last night, and the girls were finally getting bored of basketball. And then I turned on the NCAA wrestling championships, and then they got really bored. So they uh, they said we're going shopping, um, which was fine. But it was it was I, I don't watch much wrestling. I don't care for the professional wrestling at all. But the college stuff, the real stuff, right? It's it's kind of fascinating to watch. And it was the championship, so I was watching it. And uh, there was 10 matches last night, the finals matches of all the different weight divisions. And one kid from Iowa State won the national title last night in his particular weight division. And they were doing interviews with each of these guys at a microphone after they won the national championship. And so he comes forward and just immediately says, uh, the first question comes to him. And he says, first, I got I to gotta say that all glory goes to Jesus Christ. My life is nothing apart from Jesus Christ. And and he is everything, so anything else I say is because of Jesus Christ, and I give him all the glory that I have. And he said that like three or four times throughout this speech. And I walked away. It wasn't one of these just, hey, I thank God, I thank family, I think It wasn't that. It was, I mean, it was a clear, 
Christian testimony through this kid's everything he's about is Jesus Christ, and he wanted to make that clear. And I thought, boy, the, the biggest stage this kid's ever been on, right? And the pinnacle of his wrestling career, at least to this point, and he doesn't make it about himself like a lot of the other guys did. He made it all about Jesus Christ. You could see where this kid's life was centered, and I thought that was a really amazing testimony. But when we live our lives in this world, do people know where our life centers? That it's all ultimately about Jesus Christ. That we order our lives, we live our lives around that center, Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's commanding here. Walk in this wisdom around the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we do that, as Paul says, in two ways. We do that, first of all, by making the most of every opportunity, by using our time well. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, making the most of of every opportunity. We are to make the most of every opportunity that presents itself by speaking the gospel. That the gospel gets infused into those situations. That when that door opens, we take the opportunity to speak about the hope that we have in us. And we do that because there's an urgency in the days in which we live. There's an urgency there. Do we, do we recognize the urgency of the times? I think that we look at the fact that Christ has not come back for 2,000, yeah, about 2,000 years now, right? And we think, boy, it's not going to happen in my lifetime either. Or maybe we're convinced it's going to happen in my lifetime, but it's going to happen more towards the end of my lifetime, not in the next day or the next week or the next year or something like that. And so we don't live with an urgency. But what if I were to tell you that Jesus Christ is for sure, without a doubt, coming back tomorrow morning? I'm not trying, don't, don't quote me, okay? We're not making a prediction here. But if we knew that, I'm guessing we would probably say a word of prayer and pray quickly for our evangelistic efforts and we would get out of here and we would be knocking on doors and we would be calling our friends and our neighbors and our family members and we would just be pouring out the gospel nonstop for the next 24 hours. I mean, that's what we would do because of the urgency. And yet, we are to live our lives with that urgency like he could return tomorrow because he could return tomorrow. He could return in an hour. He could return at any point. We live in those last days and believers, we need to have an urgency to our lives to reveal the gospel in the way that we live and what we say. We are to use our time well, making the most of every opportunity to interject it with the gospel. We live wisely by using our time well, taking opportunities when they arise to inject the gospel, and then secondly, by flavoring our speech with the gospel. Let your conversation, your message, your speech. Now, it's, the, it's in Greek here, it's the, the, the expression is the word, your word, your words. It's the most basic word for word in the Greek language. Paul used it already earlier, and he used it in verse 3 here to speak of the gospel. It's the message there. Pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, our word. This word can refer to the gospel. It's what we're telling believers, Jesus Christ. But it can also not just refer to the gospel itself. It can also refer to our speech, our conversation. And I think that's what it's saying here in verse 6. Let your conversation, the speech that comes out of your mouth... It's the way that we talk. For us to be able to share the gospel and proclaim the gospel, we have to engage unbelievers with the gospel. That means we are going to have to talk to lost people. We're going to have to engage them in conversations. What? 
cut what, which lost people are you entering into conversation with? Do you have conversations with unbelievers? For us to communicate and proclaim the gospel, we have to be speaking to unbelievers. And there's this tendency for us today to gravitate toward fellow believers because they're the most like us. And it's easy for us. And, and, and we should. We should fellowship within this body, within this church. But as we go into the world, we are to be engaging this world with the gospel. Throughout this letter, Paul has been stressing the relationships that we have within the body of Christ. And we aren't going to downplay them. In fact, most of the message, messages we've preached in this series have focused on the relationships that we are to have with one another. But at the very end of this letter, Paul does not let us miss the missional component to our life, and that is that we are to be engaging this outside world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be very careful that in the church we don't create within this community a subculture that bubbles itself off from the rest of the world around us. And man, that can be an easy thing to do. To so shelter ourselves and our families and our children from the world that they never engage it, that we never engage it. And COVID, if anything, has given us even more opportunity to do that, to isolate. It's almost like a built-in excuse not to have to proclaim the gospel to our lost neighbors. But as we emerge from that, our life should be engaging them again in conversation. And our speech should be characterized in the way that Paul characterizes it in the end of this verse. He says, our conversation must always be what? Full of grace, seasoned with salt, and taking the opportunity to answer everyone. Our speech should be, first of all, grace-filled, full of grace. That can mean two things. It can mean, first of all, that our, our, our speech should be full of the grace of God, the message of the gospel, and it should be, that we are pointing people, that we should be bringing up the gospel truth that we don't save ourselves. God saves us. It's His grace that saves us, and so I communicate that truth by what I say. But our speech should also, secondly, be gracious, grace-filled, that what comes out of my mind is sensitive towards the needs of others, and it doesn't simply reflect my own selfish promotion, my own selfish immediate response, whether that's anger or whatever. Here's the point. As believers, our speech should always be under the control of the Holy Spirit, and it should reflect that in the way that we communicate with others. It should be full of grace. Our tongues should not be out of control if we're believers in Jesus Christ. They should not be always speaking for the promotion of self or always getting our way or putting somebody else down and being critical or demeaning toward them. Our tongues should not be vulgar. They should not be crude. That would be the opposite of grace-filled. There should be a difference between the way that the, that the believer talks and the way that those who aren't followers of Jesus Christ communicate. Our lips and our tongues should be full of grace. There's a difference between the way we talk and the way the outsider talks. And that should be known by the outsider because of the way that we communicate with them. There's a lot of Christians that in our communications, uh, they rarely do it in front of me. I'm a pastor. I get this all the time on the golf course. If I'm on a golf course and I'm playing with guys I don't know, and they ask, oh, what do you do for a living? I play golf. I mean, I don't play golf. I, I pastor a church. And they go, I wish I played golf. No, I pastor a church. And they look at me and they're like, ooh, I've got to clean up my speech. You know, and they stop all of a sudden. All the swearing stops and all of the vulgarity stops and all of that stops. And they, they get real careful. So I don't hear it too much, but it does happen sometimes. But when vulgarity or crude language or whatever is coming out of our lips, what does that suggest? That's not grace-filled, Holy Spirit-controlled language. 
I was challenging the young people earlier that sometimes we think it's cool or we need to fit in and so we use this kind of language. It's not appropriate. It's not a sign that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. It seems cool and then you regret it later on. But our language should be such that they can see a difference in the way that the Christ follower speaks. Further, if we don't reflect Christ in our language, it ruins our ability to really witness to them who Jesus Christ is. The Holy Spirit changes the way that we talk and our language should now be grace-filled. Secondly, our speech should be not only grace-filled, but it should be appealing. He says here, seasoned with salt. We are to be engaging the, the non-follower of Jesus Christ and our language should be such that they are drawn in. That there's a saltiness to it. Not in a vulgarity, but a saltiness in that it makes them want more of it. When, when we hear the term salt here, it, it's an obvious... What, what obvious passage does this bring up from the New Testament? You are the what? Salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. I don't know that Paul was quoting Jesus here, but they, it's a great parallel passage. And what Jesus was expressing and what Paul is, I think, expressing here is salt is something that's distinct within its environment. And in this particular passage, he is speaking of the fact that, that salt flavors things. It makes something appealing. It gives flavor to. I mean, we love I don't know if everybody does, but I love salt. I love salt added to things to enhance flavor. My younger daughter is a salt freak. She puts salt on everything. But I like salt. I like to enhance the flavor of it. We were on vacation this past week, and we were down in uh, Anna Maria Island, and there's this uh, bakery there called Ginny's and Jane E's, and I was talking to one of our elders at our elder meeting, and they were asking me this place must be pretty famous because they're like, hey, have you found that bakery yet? And I was like, oh yeah, I've already been there once and I'm going back tomorrow again. They make cinnamon buns that are about yay big. I kid you not. They're huge, sticky buns. I'm from Pennsylvania and sticky buns is what we call them up in Dutch country of Pennsylvania where you make them with the butter and the cinnamon and you put the walnuts on top. And The kids like the cinnamon ones with the frosting. I like the sticky buns mainly because the kids won't eat that, that one and I get to eat the whole thing. I consumed two of those this last week. I was lots of calories but I get a sticky bun like that I'm heating it up in the, uh, the microwave and then I'm putting salted butter on top of that yet why because it enhances the flavor of the sticky bun and it adds that saltiness to the sweetness and it's just oh it's just an awesome flavor it just tastes so good salt does that it enhances flavor it brings it out it intensifies it Paul is saying here that our speech, our presentation of the gospel should be an adding of salt to this message so that others are drawn in and want more and have a thirst for it. You see, God has placed us as Christ followers in this world to be salt, to confront unbelievers with this truth of the gospel so that they come to know who God is and God can use that to draw him to them, himself. You see, we go into every aspect of life. That's the beauty of this. That God places us as salt throughout his creation, throughout our culture, throughout this world. I'm not in every one of your contexts. You are. You're the salt in that context. There is a strangeness today to be going door to door and knocking on doors and just cold turkey asking people to accept Jesus Christ. There's no relationship there. I don't have the relationship with your neighbor, your family member, your coworker that you do. And so God has given you the opportunity, the open door to be that salt to his gospel message in the life of that unbeliever. 
And that's the beauty of it, that in all these various walks of life, in all of these occupations, that in our church there are people who are in the medical community, who are in the finance community, who are in construction, who are in all kinds of different walks of life and are salt in there to present the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that as Chesterton said, Christ can reclaim every square inch of this universe again and claim that it is his. I think the quote is that Jesus wants to claim mine on every square inch of this universe, and he does that by placing us into this world to reclaim those parts for him. So we should be involved in various activities and sports and community events and all of these sorts of things to be that salt within there to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ, to point back that all of this comes into being because of our loving and gracious creator and that we can have relationship with him again. Our language should be grace-filled, it should be appealing, and lastly, it should be appropriate so that you may know how to answer everyone, that you'll have the appropriate response. It's a very similar command to what Peter says in her idea, to what Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 15, that we are to be ready to provide an answer for the hope that is in us, to do it with gentleness and respect. Because believer, you and I have the right answer to every situation that we might face in life. We might not have the immediate right explanation for every detail of it, but we have the answer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the answer to suffering. We talked about that earlier, but that God allows some to go through suffering, and even allows believers to go through suffering, and there are believers right now in our congregation who are going through incredible suffering physically. And the answer to that is that a perfect Savior Jesus Christ suffered unjustly for us so that he could die in our place to give us hope even in the midst of our suffering. You have the answer to suffering. You have the answer to the meaning of life, that God's plan of redeeming all of life under his rule will someday take place. You have the answer to the uncertainty of where our government leaders are going to take us in the near future. And that is that a sovereign God can accomplish his plans and guide the course of history even through unbelieving leaders. Believers, we have the answer even to things like racial tension and violence that we see all around us in our culture. And that is that there is a king who will establish his rule over all peoples and all ethnic groups. And we as the church are to emulate and strive for that in the community of faith today extending the gospel to any and all without partiality. You have those answers, but it's going to require you to take a step out into conversation. That's not the most comfortable thing. But our mission is to confront this world with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to be praying for those opportunities for ourselves and for our church and to be entering into those conversations with the gospel on our lips to speak into. You and I are God's instrument today to reveal Jesus Christ to our friends, our neighbors, and our acquaintances. Is your life proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's close with a word of prayer this morning. Lord, as we come before you, we confess that we don't proclaim you the way that we should. That there should be more of an urgency, a consistency, a devotedness to our prayer. That rather than shy away from opportunities to proclaim the hope that we have, we should be praying for opportunities and confidence and clarity to enter into those conversations. 
And Lord, when those conversations arrive, rather than shrink back and shy away, that we speak the gospel that you are redeeming this world through the sacrifice of your son. And Lord, that our speech then should be filled with that message of grace, that it should be gracious in its communication, that it should be flavored with the salt of the gospel in our life. And it would have that clear and appropriate answer to speak and give reason for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. God, I pray for us as a church. I pray that we would see those opportunities and take those opportunities to speak the gospel. That you, Lord, would bear fruit through the communication of that gospel in the lives of our friends and our family members and our neighbors. And Lord, that our speech would be gospel-saturated. Give us those opportunities this week, Lord. Give us those opportunities over the years to come so that as Clearwater Community Church goes into the next generation, it is growing because people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, both those who enter into our church and those from our community because we are the salt in this community for Jesus Christ, that we recognize we are your instruments and that you use us, Lord, to bring people to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. God, do that through the members of Clearwater Community Church as we take the opportunities that are before us and confidently and clearly speak the message of Jesus Christ to those outside this community of faith. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. And may we clearly communicate it this week, we pray in your name. Amen. We're going to close, sing a song that uh, I think reflects a heart that longs for what he was preaching. And uh, it's a pretty bold uh, request that we make in this song, but it's that we would be possessed wholly by Christ, that we would see the entirety of our lives as uh, unto his glory and for his kingdom. And so um, you may sit or stand or whatever you want, but uh, just to consider the call of the gospel in our lives and uh, let's just borrow these words to make it our corporate prayer and that this would be true of us as the people of God here uh, as we close our time.
Jesus, my Jesus, for your glory, for your name. Jesus, my Jesus, I will only sing your praise. Jesus, my that true? Would you work in us and through us to uproot uh, idolatries and, and uh, devotions to lesser gods, lesser things, and would you liberate us to live solely for the glory of your name? Would you make it our, our joy and our passion and our desire to speak of Christ as we have opportunity? Would you make us a prayer for people? Would you this week even give us motivation and diligence to, to devote ourselves to prayer? Would you give us a watchfulness in the midst of it? Holy Spirit, would you make us a deeply grateful people because of what our inheritance is, what we will be given in Christ, what we possess currently in Christ, and may we long for others to, to have that possession. And so would you give us opportunities even this week as your church to engage others and to speak of Christ with them. And would you build your kingdom in and through this body and your churches scattered throughout this county and uh, this area. And so we pray that you would glorify yourself through the gospel as it's proclaimed, believed, and obeyed. And may we be faithful. We pray it for the glory of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here. Hope you have a great week. And uh, we'll see you next week.